record this because um, I will probably um, share it with uh, our media, the Bristol media team to put up on um, our YouTube later. Um, well, thank you for those of you who are here um, for joining us today. Um, uh, we were talking before about how <laughs> we're at the worst point of the semester in the worst year. <laughs> it's advising time, it's paper grading time, it's we're all sick of Zoom time um, and done with online teaching time. So that might explain why there's only a few people here, but that's okay. Um, other people might be able to check this out later. Um, but for those of you here, glad you're here. Um, so some of you may have been at the last event, which was a little different. It was more of a just kind of broad discussion. Um, we can definitely have some space for discussion today, but um, the, the main idea today is um, uh, I thought it would be interesting. So, so we're here to talk about um, our one book uh, uh, this year once again, uh, which is Educated, uh, which is a memoir by Tara Westover about uh, her experience growing up in a um, kind of extremist Mormon survivalist um, uh, apocalyptic uh, uh, family, um, you know, where her, her particularly her father was uh, very paranoid of um, anything that was sort of governmental or mainstream, like mainstream medicine, uh, public education, things like that. And as a result of that, she um, never went to school at all. And was not even really homeschooled, um, <laughs> you could say even, um, but but somehow she um, she learned enough to kind of squeeze herself into Brigham Young University at 17 years old and and um, eventually go on for a master's degree and a PhD at Cambridge University. And so the book's all about just her life and experience, um, kind of overcoming a lot of challenges and just growing up in this very um, odd environment. Um, and so because the book, you know, brings up so many um, interesting topics around like education and like mental health and psychology and things like that, I thought it would be cool to like get some of our in-house experts, some of our faculty here at Bristol to just um, kind of just talk about what they noticed in the book from the perspective of their field, um, from the perspective of the subject they deal with every day in the classroom and as scholars and thinkers. Um, so I put out a call. And so today we have um, a few uh, a few of our faculty. We've got uh, Kara Norberg from Early Education, um, who I'm sure has some capital T thoughts on, <laughs> on what, happens to, what happened to Tara and her family um, and how that impacted her. Um, and then um, we have Colleen Avedikian from Sociology, um, who I know has some thoughts on this. Um, <laughs> already shared some of those in the book club, the book discussion we had a few weeks ago. And then um, we have our dark horse, um, David Ledoux from Theater. You wouldn't you wouldn't think that education, the book Educated and Theater Connect. And, um, but, but, but David has, has some thoughts um, as well. And actually, um, uh, if you wanna uh, mention a few words here right off the bat, David, I know you have a theater workshop um, about Educated coming up next week. So yeah, do you wanna say yeah. something about that? Yeah, um, I mean, it's some, it, it's, it, the title of the workshop next week is uh, The Unreliable Mind, and we will be exploring some of the themes that I'm sure we'll talk about today, um, and we'll be using some theater tools and techniques to explore that. Um, and, you know, what I mean by theater tools and techniques, I, I don't necessarily mean that you're going to be acting like a chicken uh, or, <laughs> you know, putting yourself out there in a histrionic theatrical way. What I mean by exploring it using theatrical terms is exploring the world of the play, uh, the themes of the play from a first person, personal, experiential viewpoint. How can you uh, uh, explore this through that lens? So that'll be the uh, same time, same place, uh, two o'clock next Wednesday. So uh, nice. yeah, it should be a lot of fun. Nice. Yeah. So. Um... Yeah, so I'm ex I'm signed up for that. I'm excited to um, experience that. 
Um, so yeah, so I figured the way that today would work is I would just kind of um, ask each of our panelists here to sort of, um, yeah, just start off by kind of sharing, you know, a little bit about their thoughts about educated, again, from the perspective, the perspective they're coming from as, as teachers and scholars, um, and then just sort of see how the conversation goes uh, from there. And, you know, for those of you who are um, especially uh, students in the room here, if you have any questions at, at some point, we can certainly, you can certainly throw those out and, uh, and uh, yeah, see how things go. Um, so I, I, I think David, I, since you already spoke a little bit, uh, maybe it'll just go with you since you're coming from the most unusual perspective, I think, or unusual connection um, of how, you know, uh, this connects. Um, so yeah, like, so as a, as someone who's involved in theater and who teaches theater um, and obviously has been thinking about, you know, you've been creating a workshop around educated, I'm curious, so what has, what, um, what do you notice reading a book like Educated or what kind of sticks out to you or what like patterns are you like observing as you, as you read a book like this, particularly, again, yeah, as you mentioned, this is, um, you know, it's a first person uh, memoir. It's all about memory and the nature of, of memory. So I'm curious, like, you know, what um, has stuck out to you coming from that, thinking about from that perspective as a, a theater person? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, when I read the book, um, I was really, I mean, as so many people were blown away and the, um, the the reason I was blown away is because it deals with a, a few things, some of the core things that I always think about, deal with, explore in my work. And from you know when you're when you're a hammer, the world looks like a bunch of nails. And so I'm a theater person, and so it always seems completely obvious to me like what the connections are. You know, <laughs> like I'm like, oh yeah, this is. Absolutely, it makes complete sense that this is a, a great book for to learn using theater. Um, I mean, not the least of which is one of the first uh, moments in the book that was one of uh, the first pivotal moments that sparked some sort of awakening. One of the first things that sparked and understanding that there's a world out there that is not the world I take for granted, the, the world that is being told to me, was when she did a production of Annie. <laughs> um, theater, art, music, dance, this was a catalyst that ended up taking her on a lifelong exploration of learning in the mind. And for me, uh, the thing that fascinates me about theater and that fascinated fascinated me about this book is the the title the reason I titled the workshop next week the unreliable mind the more that i work in theater the more i explore characters the more i explore how my mind is malleable and how my past is malleable and how i make connections to things in the characters that I play or the characters that my actors play, if I'm directing or if I'm writing, how you mold emotion and thought and perception. Uh, it's a very fluid thing. It's not this rock solid thing that we like to think it is. Like I am a me that is unchanging for my whole life. The Our perception of the world is just, a bunch of stories, layered, nuanced stories. And so uh, I think that's for me what this book is really about. It's, a, it's about how unreliable our minds are, how our worldviews can change. And the thing that Tara seems to be trying to do, or the thing that happened to her, in my view, is not that she had an education and she learned a bunch of stuff, she didn't learn facts that, oh, I didn't know the Holocaust exists. The Holocaust did exist, so now my mind has changed. It's not that she learned facts. 
it's that she learned a new story. She learned a new story of how the world exists. And even now, as you read her book, she's struggling to figure out what that story is. What is my, what was my memory of this moment of abuse? What was my memory of my parents? Do I have it right? Or do the facts necessarily line up? Or what's the perspective of looking at the facts? Um, she got, it came to a point where she didn't even know if the sky was blue towards the end of the book. She said, I had to ask people, you know, so the sky is blue. I think it's blue, but what does that even mean? And so uh, this tenuous relationship to our own minds is something that you deeply and personally engage in when you do theater, because you're trying to actually, actually put yourself in the position of other human beings. And in the process of doing that, you realize how, again, how fluid our minds are and our take on reality is. So those are just a few, few of my impressions. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think that's, I think, I mean, I haven't read, I haven't read a ton of memoirs, but I, I did notice, like, I feel like that's something kind of unique about this one in that she, um, she does, she kind of pulls back the curtain, right? She interrogates the, even the idea of a memoir in a way like as she's in the way that she writes it, like she has like, there's footnotes in some of the sections where it's like, she's like, well, I remembered it this way, but then I talked to one of my brothers, you know, and he has, um, you know, he remembered it slightly differently. Or like you said, like, I think, you know, one of the things that comes up particularly later in the book um, is the idea of gaslighting, right? where you know she confronts you know she talks in the book about you know this abuse this um kind of uh, physical emotional verbal abuse that she suffered at the hands of her brother that um she her brother she calls sean um and then you know she confronts her parents later on right and and it's no this didn't happen right and like you said it it sort of breaks her brain at a point where she's like she doesn't know what's what's real anymore. So I think that's a particularly interesting thing about this one, right? Because anybody can write a, a memoir about their lives, but I think in this, because of how, yeah, like how controlling, like in a way her father gave her the, her narrative, right? Like you were talking about the have stories, like a different stories, like her father was really the one that kind of imposed a narrative on her, right? Of like, this is the way the world is, this is, you know, and she had to sort of find a different story for herself, right? Um, I think to kind of use your language and, but at the same time being told, no, 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 this is, the, you know, this is the correct narrative and she, and that, so it interrogates, like, like you said, I think the nature of memory itself and even the nature of memoir as a form of writing, right? Um, uh, yeah, that's awesome though, I love that. And I, <laughs> I had totally forgot that she was involved in the, I, you know, I read through the book a while ago, like last summer. Uh, I had totally forgot about Annie. I mean, I knew she was into, I knew she was a singer and she was like, loved singing. And I remember in one of the, her interviews, she talks about, you know, thinking she would like go to college, you know, get into college, you know, be like a train, you know, go to college for music or singing. Um, but I forgot the theater component. That's true. That was like one of her, and it's funny because her dad allowed that, right? Because it was like, oh, well, he saw that she was talented and like, you know, people were like complimenting him on her, on, on her ability. And so like he allowed that, you know, there were, there was like, you know, he was inconsistent, you know, in what he sort of allowed and didn't allow, but he allowed that. But that was enough, like you pointed out, to kind of set her on this trajectory of like, it was like a crack, right? It was a crack in the the sort of uh um this these barriers her her dad had like put around her life in a way um yeah i think um i don't know if you've caught any of the interviews with her but she talks um a lot about that kind of perspective that 
part of her father, she believes, is truly feels proud of what she's accomplished. But he does that based on, oh, see what homeschooling did. See, my daughter now has a doctorate. So what I did is responsible for that. And she talks about that kind of coming through, I think, with some of those areas as, as well. As much as he questions and ridicules her for, um, you know, even now for her education, there's a part of him that feels like he's responsible. I mean, he's just kind of that all being um, that feels responsible even for her success. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, 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 um, yeah, it's, it's, it's odd, but it also makes sense mm -hmm. because, you know, when you look at her, when you start to maybe, and again, you know, we're just speculating on, you know, she speculates later in the book, you know, she's in a class in college and the professor's talking about bipolar and she's like, that's my dad. Like, and mm -hmm. so obviously, you know, it's speculation on our part, whether mm -hmm. the dad had any sort of mental health issues, although it seems pretty, um, pretty obvious, even without official diagnosis, but obviously you wonder, you know, how that plays in, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the mood swings and, and stuff. And, but yeah. Um, so Carol, you're coming from the perspective of sure. like early ed, mm -hmm. uh, which I feel like, you know, there's probably some, probably different language, but there, I think maybe some ways thinking about early education and childhood development dovetails with what David was talking about. But I'm curious from- Absolutely. Um, from okay. your perspective, yeah, what are things that you notice okay. as like, uh, think about child development, mm -hmm. early education and stuff. And I think I just wanted to piggyback on one of the things that David said, he talked about theater being that first opportunity to put yourself in other people's perspectives. And we see that in early childhood too. Dramatic play is the first time children move from that egocentric thought to, okay, now I'm playing the role of a cat. So as a cat, well, how does a cat behave? Or how does a mom behave or a dad or whatever role they're playing. And so for young children, that dramatic play really opens up. It allows for them to, for the first time, to see things truly from somebody else's perspective. So that makes sense on a different level. She did not have those same opportunities early on, but even later on, how much she benefited from that, that ability to, to put yourself in somebody else's perspective. I think the pieces that stood out to me and it, it brought back so many of the books that we have used. And, and granted, I read this book um, two years ago. I read it the year before it was nominated. Um, and it, there was portions of I Am Alala, Hillbilly Allergy. Um, and it's that concept of resilience and grit. I, I'm always drawn to that. And when you think of some of the models that we understand early childhood, we could look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, and the effects of chronic stress on children. Or we could take an ecological perspective where we look at all the influences in her life from her family to, um, to her very limited exposure to other people, to the community, to her lack of medical care. Um, and then look at that from what were the stressors? What were the buffers? What were her strengths? Because trying to understand how she did gain the knowledge that she needed um, you know, and, and it's kind of, you know, the, the mention of homeschooling is there, but I think everybody agrees that it really wasn't, there was no real educational opportunity. So how did she construct her knowledge? Because the foundations are all in early childhood and she doesn't have a lot of what we're, what we typically recommend or typically what we see in order for people to be resilient. So some of the ways, and, and, and I was thinking back sort of, I am Malala and Hillbilly Elegy. But this desire for knowledge, this desire for learning seems to be a very prevalent resiliency factor that I've gotten from all of those, um, all of the, the um, people that we have read about. Um, but I spent a lot of time thinking, where did she get the knowledge? Where did she get those foundational skills that later could allow her to teach herself algebra, to teach, you know, and then to, to start at college with a formalized education? Um, and, you know, she had some exposure to books that had to be hidden. Um, she got information secondhand from her brother. Um, she clearly has a high intelligence of her own that she was born into this world with, with that ability. Um, and, and really just beginning to look at where, what, what knowledge did she take? And then how did that inform later on? I think, you know, the opportunity she had with her mother learning about herbal medicines, um, even the work she did with her father, which was potentially dangerous, these are opportunities in her life where she gathered knowledge. She was able to construct the meaning. 
And although you're absolutely right that the narrative was dictated by her father, if she didn't have those experiences, those hands-on opportunities for learning, I just don't see how those synapses in the brain would be connected so that there would be a point where she can jump into college education having missed all that formalized education. Um, it's sort of really, it, it blows my mind. Um, I to harass myself last night, I was watching a bunch of her videos and it was hours later, I had completely lost myself into her um, retelling of some of the stories and, and her experiences. And what for her, what she was joking about the title educated, she meant that to be provocative. Um, and she said, um, you know, what she was really thinking that to be educated is the making of a person, which reminded me of the 10 movies. <laughs> um, but that concept of to become a person, you have to be able to understand and recognize that there are perspectives different than your own. Um, and so, you know, for in the beginning of theater, those that those opportunities um, with her music um, and then eventually going into an environment where where people thought very differently. She was able to see that. And she talked about that, I think, in one of the videos it was almost kind of like an hour of different takes she had on that. But to her, that was the most critical piece is realizing that people don't all view information the same way that we all. Um, see things differently. And she really advocated, especially in college, that we're not just giving one narrative, that we're really allowing people to make choices for themselves, giving people the information and seeing knowledge as power um, as, a way to, um, as a way to do that. And I think she was somewhat critical of, of the education system, even though she didn't participate in it. Um, for the lack of some of those pieces. Um, so that's I, I, so I, that's what kind of has been spinning around my head is that sense of making a person because we really feel those foundational roots in early childhood. And she really contradicts all of what <laughs> we typically talk about is needed. I mean, in terms of the experiences she got. Um, but I do think that the fact that she had so many hands-on experience for learning, whether or not it was learning how to um, take oil out of a tank, even though people typically got hurt when they were doing that. I think that helped with those connections in the brain and those synapses, because that type of real life skill learning um, is really important for young children. Now, typically, we wouldn't put them in situations where they'd be, it's so dangerous, but that opportunity to learn in the moment. And I think that when kids are typically homeschooled, um, where they're able to get some of the, the more formalized knowledge and then more of the hands-on knowledge is a great benefit for, for um, children. But she didn't never had that other piece of it. She just had the um, hands-on piece, which is not typical. And that got me, make, um, got me thinking about what is the, even the requirements for homeschooling. So I started um, researching um, that um, because obviously none of the, those um, practices were put in place. Um, so I guess I'm still in awe, but I, I found such similarities in her voice to I am Alala, to Hillbilly Elegy, um, that thirst for knowledge, understanding that knowledge equals power. Um, um, I just, it, it's just, it's, it's amazing to me. And hear her, to hear her speak, um, I, I could listen to her for hours and she sings just like an angel. She has the most beautiful, I don't know if you've gotten a chance to hear her sing, but um, she has the most beautiful voice. Um, so that's that's how I started to see things. And, and that's how my mind started to organize those experiences was thinking about all that we know about developmental theory and then what fits in. And then there are some pieces that really don't fit, because if you looked at it from surely from Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we wouldn't have seen the success. Um, I don't think would have um, we would have seen the success. Um, so I think it's interesting to see how that we can believe in these models. But there's a whole lot else that can happen and people are resilient and um, can achieve achieve what, what it is that they wanna accomplish. Yeah, yeah. And I think to be fair too, like, um, you know, in talking about her resilience, like her, it, you know, things definitely weren't a walk in the park either. Like, I mean, even when, you, you know, she finally gets to Brigham yes. Young, like she really struggles early on, Absolutely. right? Um, I mean, in their, like there are moments there where she could have easily given up and gone back, right? And in that case, like, you know, I mean, there were, you know, instances where I think she had help, like external help, right? Mm -hmm. Like her roommates, like helping her, like- this Even is going how you, to like, shower and clean and- Yeah, absolutely. yeah, yeah. Or like at one point, I think this came up in the book discussion. I think like um, 
there's like a bishop you know like a church leader who like basically is like she has i think it was a dental issue yeah. it was like i will pay for you to like mm -hmm. get this taken care of so you can like um i think actually colleen you brought some of this up last time too like um it's tricky because I think you brought this up like Tara is an exception, but what about the people who don't, you know, there's so many who don't, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and that's the, I mean, that's the thing. I think that's the nature of like these kinds of stories is the exceptional stories mm -hmm. are the ones that mm -hmm. get written, yes. right? Yeah. The stories of all the other people who don't make it through really no fault of their own, right? Because mm -hmm. I think that's, that's, that's the downside sometimes of having these exceptional stories mm -hmm. is they can be used as then like a, a, a club to beat other people over the head. And mm -hmm. It's like, you know, the issue of racism right now, right? You have exceptional like black people who do well. And then, but that sometimes is then used as a, a club over the head of other black people. Who will go, Why can't you be like this person and like get out and like do better? But um, so I don't know if you want to speak to that at all, Colleen, or have <laughs> other thoughts you want to speak to as I, well. I, I, well, I appreciate that. Can you can you hear me? I have a new headset. Okay, it all works. Yep. So first, I wanted to say a special welcome to Amanda and Tracy um, for coming out on such a beautiful day to hear you know faculty talk about <laughs> how you know how how this book is seen uh, through their eyes and through their discipline. So um, I'm glad that you're here. Yeah, um, I, I was. I'll, I'll just comment on that, Chris. Thank you uh, for remembering. Yeah, my, I, I, I am always wary when um, in the in the talk show circuit, right? So when Tara Westover appears uh, on the Ellen Show, again, it's the celebration of this. You know, this individual overcame uh, um, these obstacles, and and uh, I'm not unaware of how people are motivated by those that they see. We often think, you know, have bigger dreams when we see what people have been able to achieve. So, so it does serve an important function, but also I think reinforces the idea that, you know, it, it, that, that individuals overcome obstacles and if they don't, then therefore, you know, there's some deficit there. People aren't trying hard enough. I mean, we, we live in a, a society where there's often, you know, less sympathy for people who have, you know, the have nots, people who are poor. It's that they're not trying hard enough. Not, there's this kind of attitude that that we're often more sympathetic to to poor people externally to the outside of the United States because we think you you know you're just not making the correct choices. So I, I was uncomfortable more with how in the maybe the the um, public perception of this book uh, how it was kind of framed as as a you know a, a can another can do uh, a story a feel good story if you will. I mean this this. Yeah has all the you know this is a blockbuster in the making it has it has a little bit of everything right so that's that's really where my comments were uh, before um but i did want to talk um about the way in which uh, sociologists would would view this right or, or how many sociologists would view this and just like david talked about if you're a hammer you see the world as as nails and and uh, uh sociologists at least try to uh employ something called the sociological imagination to all situations which it, it, which in in kind of uh, very simplistic terms is that what happens to us on the individual level is often forces of social, you know, social forces that are uh, largely outside of our, con uh, you know, view of con uh, control. So, um, you know, in looking at Tara's story, we certainly see issues related to like family and social class and gender and race and religion and geography and uh, historical moment. There are lots of religion. There's a lot of um, things that we can we can see in terms of how that shapes uh, her experiences, you know, at, at this point in time. But I just, um, I think in a, in a social one-on-one -on -one class, what we would probably focus on this concept uh, that we call um, agents of socialization, right? So the, the assumption in sociology is that a lot of what, what we experience is real and so on is defined by the experiences we have from, you know, with others. And um, the, the primary agent of socialization is in fact the family, right? So we learn and we get our experiences early on. And even though we grow and we move on, many of those experiences still shape what we think is natural, normal, moral, and, and so on, long into, you know, into our adulthood. And so, um, 
in the sociology class, we probably look at how the, the role of family and particularly the, the family's views, the father's views around um, it, not just about uh, education, but also about medicine, right? What their attitudes around medicine, the attitudes around uh, the role of women. You know, the, uh, Tara's mother was becoming more independent at the time of her accident, right? Time that the, the son driving the car, there's a terrible accident. And then that how also changes the family. And, and Tara becoming educated, whatever that means, right? So we'll talk about the formal education here. Uh, it did pose a threat to the father's role in her life. Right, and I, and I think that it was threatening in a way that it, it perhaps wasn't as threatening when his sons went away for college. So yes, when somebody changes or they have experiences that then makes them rethink uh, their family dynamic or re rethink the, their place in the world or even challenge the, the authority or the hierarchy in the family, there is resistance. Um, we, we see this sometimes in our own students. <clears throat> we. Um, we see where um, you know it's okay to be uh, to get a certain level of education, but don't change. I mean, it's very, very threatening, uh, and I see that in particular for um, some of our um, first-generation students who are female, right? If if they're they're if they have more power in the family than culturally or historically women have had, how that really does upend um, uh, the, the the dynamic. Right. So there, there's a lot, you know, in this book I, that I really felt that would provide rich discussion um, for for a sociologist. But just to quickly jump back on Carol's point, I mean, you, you're uh, Carol, you're talking about, you know, really, what does it mean to be educated? And I think that the Tara ends the book. One of the quotes that really jumped out to me is when she's talking about um, how she can't go back. I mean, she just can't go back. She 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 would try and go back. But who she is now this process that she's lived through, it's not just formal education, but it was those, those pieces that you're talking about. Her life has been about learning these experience. She she's, writes, you could call the selfhood many things, transformation, metamorphosis, falsity, betrayal, I call it an education. I mean, I think that 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 um, she's really explaining uh, her choice of the, the book. It also um, how how the the, um, the gains and the losses as part of this process that she did lose this relationship with the family, even though she acknowledges that it's dysfunctional and, and so on. Um, anyway, those are my thoughts on that. Well, that's, a, that, that's a good point you made. Like. Uh, and I, and I never, I don't think I'd ever made that connection that like the dad is, yeah, the dad is more favorable to the, the sons going to college. Like even I think she has one of her younger brothers at one point, cause he thinks, oh, well, he's going to go to college and get smart. So then he can like use that education to like stymie the secularists or whatever, you know, whatever in his view. But but, but it makes sense that like within the, the father's view within, you know, the father's got a very patriarchal perspective, right? And like, so for the sons to be educated is not a threat, but for Tara, a woman, right? To become educated and more independent is a threat to the social order, right? Kind of like the social hierarchy. Um, Cause she talks about right earlier on how um, and this kind of gets to like even what um, uh, I think David was talking about the idea of a story like in her mind her story is I'm gonna like I'm gonna grow up get married have kids right like I think she talks about when she was younger like in her mind that's the that's her life story right that's kind of the, the life plan laid out for her um, which, you know, fits a very sort of, again, like patriarchal structure, right? Of like these, you know, here's the, here are the rules for men, here are the rules for women. Um, and so, yeah, like she, you know, when she starts to, yeah, so, and, and kind of maybe this also ties back to, I think, Dave, what you were saying about, like, it's not just about, uh, I'm kind of connecting what you're pointing out, Colleen, and what David said, where, like education isn't just about facts. It's it's about um, growth and change, right? And we become like education again. What, however you define that, formally and informally, it makes us different people. We literally become different people, right? Um, and 
in in a way and so like yeah she can't go she's no longer the same person right she can't go back because she's she's a round peg in a square hole now right she's not a square peg in a squirrel anymore she's a she's a differently shaped peg entirely right so it's like so i think that's an interesting idea too that sometimes um but yeah that there's two like you said that there's a cost to that there can be a cost right like um you know i think of certain you know we like you said we see that i think we see that in like um well i think we see it cross culturally right you see it in like students coming from um students coming to like bristol who are like first gen students from more traditional cultures we might say but even in the united states like um you know i think in certain areas and honestly it tends to be in more rural areas of the country you have this like um you know the sort of don't get above your raising type mentality like like okay like there's kind of this like well we want you to get educated we want you to be smart so you can like get a good job or whatever but um well, we don't want you to, like ch again change too much so then you're like better than us right Right, and there are different groups have different ways of doing it. So Irish uh, immigrants do something called slagging. Slagging is where they're totally going to be um, mocking you. You're going to be now the educated one or the one that went off or the one who's different in whatever way that means. They've gone off to the city and their the country, and they're different somehow. That the, that the people behind are going to relentlessly mock and attack that change to kind of like that leveling experience. Like you, you're, you're still one of us or it's it's a it's a way of kind of bringing you back into the to the fold per se and that takes place in all kinds of ways in all kinds of spaces right um we do see that along social class we see it along religious lines uh certainly race and ethnic traditions yeah is there so, oh i'm sorry um so i oh, just go ahead jackie yeah you know piggyback on that so um you know teaching esl for so many years and um our esl students um, <laughs> they think of their ESL faculty as um, not just advisors for scheduling, but kind of like advisors for life. I feel like I should have like a couch and say, here's your couch and your box of Kleenex, you know, <laughs> to make yourself at home because uh, <laughs> they're really in our office a lot. And, and they get very, very comfortable. We're, you know, typically we're their first contact here in the United States, you know, as outside the family. And they don't know a lot of other people and we make them feel comfortable and at home as so many of our great faculty do but we're their first contact so they they're some of them really open up about some very personal things and um you know i'm going to um, be honest with you guys i mean i'm i'm the faculty member that snuck in the back door to see what y'all were thinking about <laughs> this book and uh and and really you know, trying to glean some ideas for um, writing and topics going forward in my writing classes, but um, but this 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 story uh, resonates with conversations I have had with my students. Um, I, I I have had students sit in the chair, um, literally, and we're both crying. You know, student starts crying, or maybe I start, one of us start. Uh, you know, it's like very hard to hold back the tears. It's just the stories. That, are, I mean, not dissimilar to this book. So um, there's so much to glean here, you know, it, from a faculty person's point of view, when I hear these types of stories and, and this book, it reminds me of, you know, when you, when, you, when you have someone in your classroom, you just don't know, you know, you just simply do not know where they've come from and what, they, what their life experiences have been. And same thing for um, students, you know, uh, your, your, your peers, you know, the students' peers. Um, there's just so much meanness, you know, in uh, K through 12. And hopefully um, kids grow up when they get to college. But, you know, this is a good book for students to read because the story is not just in the pages of that book. You know, it, it's in the it's in the seat next to yours, you know, or the, or the zoom or the zoom tile next to your. You just don't know. Um, so I, I think that's it's important that way. But 
I love the idea of um, thinking about, uh, you know, I'm thinking about for, for writing topics and, and conversation topics, you know, how do your experiences mold, not just your perceptions, but what you do with your life? And, and, and you know, the idea of how do some people, why, why and how are some people able to make it such a different chapter, you know, in, in, their, in their book. Um, I, you know, I don't know what drives some people to take tragedy really and make it a success or, or somehow, you know, bend it, you know, in another direction. I'm not sure what that all is. You know, maybe it is, you know, we're talking about the just, maybe these are questions to pose, you know, so what is your desire of, of, for knowledge? You know, uh, how does, you know, knowledge equal power? You guys have said so many, you all have said so many powerful things here um, that have me thinking and, and hope, and I've taken some notes because I'm hoping to um, forward them uh, to my students, you know, for, for topics to think about our conversations because I teach both the conversations and the writing and kind of a little of everything. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the idea of how you use your experience, how you gather knowledge, what the importance of it is, your, the importance of your experience and the knowledge or your desire for knowledge and identifying how you want to use it to make yourself better, you know, or how you want to use it in your life or through your life. Um, I think that's, I think that's kind of a universal um, question that would really be good for some students. Some students are already don't even know it. They're already doing this sort of thing. You know, they're kind of putting, I, I'm in a mess and I know that, and this is what I want to do. But some students just kind of like go with the flow, and, you know, and maybe if they're taking stock of what, where they've been and why they're here and what they really want to do and what that all means. So I think it's a great, um, great points for reflection and that sort of thing. And um, the, the good news is um, some of these students that I've, I've mentioned to you that I've had conversations with that, um, you know, bring tears to your eyes. Most of those students, I, I see at least through my courses and maybe the next semester, um, you know, they're very driven and they make it despite all of that. A lot of them. I mean, there's always the ones that you just don't see again. But um, so that's hopeful. That's hopeful. So anyway, uh, but I, so I, you know, I want to thank you all for your um, awesome thoughts um, and just putting it together so eloquently and succinctly because <laughs> I got some great ideas. Thank you. <laughs> that's all. That's a, that's a great point, Jackie, about, um, I don't know, the idea of, yeah, like how do students take their own, I mean, obviously like we, um, <laughs> It's a tricky question. We're all stuck in the, um, we're, we all know we're stuck in an antiquated education system, right? Like that was designed for like in, you know, industrialization and like, you know, um, some ways, you know, like rub, you know, cookie cutter, making cookie cutter, you know, students in some ways, right? And obviously we're all trying to like figure out how to like modernize that. But yeah, like, I think that's a great thing is like, is like, how can we like, encourage students to like leverage what is unique to them and their experience like how do you as a student leverage what is unique about you right what you might even think of as weaknesses right especially i think you know probably for you jackie you know you've got students coming in probably thinking that all they have is weaknesses in some ways right it's like oh i like i don't speak the language i just or at least maybe not all but at least maybe feeling deficient right um in some ways but like how can you like how can we teach our students to like, um, yeah, leverage their unique experience, whatever that is to like, you know, um, on this journey of education, right? Again, it's like more than just like, as Dave was saying, it's more than just like a fat collecting tour, right? It's, it's, it's a, 
um, it's it's a it's a journey of growth and stuff. And and then like another thing you said too just made me think about like gosh like um, I can't remember what you were saying earlier, but it made me think of how like you know um, the moment in the story where Tara talks about how she was in you know, a class and, and the, the word Holocaust came up in the textbook or something. And, you know, she raised her hand and she was like, like, what does this mean? And the professor, like, and everyone else, like, kind of gave her dirty looks. And I'm, I'm trying to remember if even in the story, the professor had said something or later, like, don't make jokes like that. And I mean, granted, that is a pretty odd situation, like student unknown in the Holocaust, but I'm just like thinking like, that could have been it, right? At that moment, she could have just felt shut down, just like, I'm stupid, like, I am a failure. I'm packing it up and going home, right? Um, and uh, just, yeah, it makes me think of like, oh gosh, have there been moments, you know, in my own teaching where I like, you know, made a student feel stupid or small, you know, by like how I reacted to something, right? And like, you know, I could just I think it's the destroy a student. <laughs> Um, you know, you know, we're, you know, just our posture as teachers, right? How do we like, um, how do we posture ourselves as teachers, you know, where, you know, yeah, we might have those situations sometimes where students like, I don't, you know, we're all highly educated, right? As instructors, but like, you know, we have a student that's like, I don't know about X, Y, or Z. And right, is our response like, what do you mean? What are you, what are you stupid? Like, you know, but, but rather like, oh, okay, well, this is a learning moment, right? Like, cause again, like, oh, I think that's what you're saying, Jack, is like, we don't know, we don't know what the student's story is. You know, we show up at the beginning of a semester with 22 students, I show up with 22 students in a classroom. That's like 22 life experiences that I have zero knowledge of, right? That it's like, um, and I'm going to learn some of that. I'm going to get a sliver of it, but it's like, we don't, we don't really know right it's it's so artificial right they show up in our classroom and he we're here to do this thing but like they all come with so much baggage and backstory that we have zero idea about right and like hey, can um, i jump in with, can i jump in with that it was something, yeah, yeah, something yeah. related to that because yeah. i think you're saying a lot of really uh great things that i've thought a lot about and uh it, one of them is the assumptions that we make, the, the biases that we have. Uh, there's, there's one way of reading this book that I think is in the pop culture, Ellen, uh, Oprah sort of world, where it's a sort of reverse fish out of water story. Uh, a fish out of water story would be, you know, you have a fish that belongs and then goes somewhere else where it doesn't belong, but it learns lessons Maybe the world learns lessons, but both are fundamentally unchanged. It's still a fish and it's still a world. This seems to be the story of a fish that was born out of water. It's a fish that was born in a place that it didn't quite belong, but it functioned and then it discovered water. And so we can all pat ourselves on the back and we can say, oh, well, yeah, I mean, her family's crazy and we're all sane. We're educated. Our world is very sane. We know what reality is. Thank God she came over to our side. And so it's this like reverse fish out of water story that can get us to judge her family, pat ourselves on the back. And ultimately I think uh, miss the crucial question that I come away with, which is constantly in my mind as a theater artist. It's constantly in my mind as you know somebody who likes to think about things uh, and, and cares about putting my finger on the truth of what's happening in the world. The question is, what might I be accepting as truth that is in fact incomplete or a distorted story? And if you're not constantly asking yourself that question, if you're not constantly skeptical as to what that quest, what, you know, your whole view might be totally fundamentally wrong, or you might be missing something. You might not be wrong. It might be more complicated than that. It might not be a dichotomy or a, or, or a binary. It might be some, something gray. And uh, yeah, so I think that's, the, that's like probably the most profound thing from this book. It's just a reminder 
that we could all be the father. It's not a book about judging the father or the mother or the, the family or their way of life. It's, it's a real, um, you know, it's something that has been alluded to also here is this idea of selfhood and the self and what are the core things that you have that allow you to get here and something that again as a theater artist when you're looking at attaching yourself to the self of a character how do you do that well you have to look at yourself as a process there is no one self there is no one unchanging rock solid thing that's you you are a triangulation of a lot of different perceptions and memories and ideas and none of them if you pay attention none of those are yours you got them from a world around you and so you're constantly changing so you, i think the book is uh it's a disservice to the pop culture idea to think that we should pat ourselves on the back uh because it's all i think where she's writing from is like life is complicated and I'm very conflicted with how I feel about my family. So there are no answers here. There are only questions. It doesn't quite fit neatly into our liberal, well-educated <laughs> self-congratulatory paradigm all the time, which I like you bring that up. Cause I mean, maybe you noticed this Carol, it sounds like you watched a lot of stuff last night. She is very, she's very careful not to be like, like just like sit there and like, even in the Ellen interviews, like and some of the other, you can tell by like, <laughs> you can kind of tell they're like fishing for the juice um and she like she kind of refuses to like trash her family like absolutely she's, and, she's and like what, you know like this happened or that like she's like at least now it seems like she's gotten to a place of like uh you know she's kind of at peace you know like even though she's separated from them it's it, and she's not like bitter or like just like um yeah like she's not trashing them but she's um even though i feel like again you know as as you were saying david i think the media kind of wants some of that you know, like the juicy kind of you know she's like because even and, and even in her stance now like like she's very sort of yeah she's not like um she doesn't fit neatly into sort of the progressive side or the conservative side per se like and I know she's talked about this too. Like she's really talked about like, you know, she's someone that comes from ruralism and now she traffics in, you know, urban progressive circles. And she's talked about how like, you know, there are lots of wrong per perceptions in like urban progressive circles about rural people, like in rural life. And like, I think she kind of sees herself as trying to bridge some of that in a way that, you know, like, like there are people on, Complex, there are complex people on all sides, right? In, in, in all of these kind of walks of life. But yeah, Carol, did you wanna? Uh, yeah, it, I first wanted to comment on um, her relationship with the parents because she did, one of the interviews, it wasn't, um, I think it was on um, the American Council of Education was one of the ones that I had um, checked, but she talked about the love she feels for her parents and how children, despite their experience, the majority of children love and, and but she said just loving um, in, in loving them, you may need to be separate from them. And so, um, you know, and she says that I believe my dad loved us. You know, it's not like he denied us medical care and then had medical care himself. He was shaped by the belief system he, he had. And I think if I, when one of the things that I really heard in her voice is this sort of understanding, even when it comes to race or, or differences that um, to really to really listen to people and to understand how their experiences have shaped their viewpoints and not to jump down people's throats and to really, um, there's this quiet reflection about her even when she, she doesn't answer right away. She sort of pauses, she thinks about things, but I think she really was also speaking to the polarization that's happening um, in our country right now. And that there's so much of not listening as a means of understanding, but more as listening as a way of responding back. and. Um, I just thought she had so much to teach us and such an openness around it. And I do think you're right about coming to some sort of peace, but I think that's the piece that she is most tied to right now is how can we do this? How can we listen to each other? How can we present information, but allow people to, 
to really what I, I call is constructing your own knowledge. And, and that's what we try to do in early childhood is giving kids information, but that knowledge is yours to construct. And your belief system might look differently and that's okay. And so she really sort of honored the process of, of people not always doing the right things, but working on that path and, and, and the kind of that concept you do better when you know better um, sort of um, framework, which I just looked at my Angela's quote for something else and that one came up and it reminded me of um, what she was saying. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's, that's, that about sums it up. That's, I think that's, I mean, that's our goal. Hope, well, that's hopefully, right? Our goal for ourselves mm -hmm. and for our students, mm -hmm. right? Is like, um, how can we all be more curious and maybe, and listen more and, uh, and be open more. And uh, I mean, interestingly, I think we're gonna be continuing to, or we're gonna continue to have an opportunity to explore these ideas further even next year. So like, um, uh, our, we have our book for next year, which is um, A Tale of Two Americas, Stories of Inequality and the Divided Nation, which is our first anthology. But um, I think it's it's going to be another chance to kind of explore, again, some of this polarization, kind of the mm -hmm. urban rural divides and perceptions and, and stuff. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how some of what we've talked about, talked about or in and around this book will sort of roll into even um, next academic year with the new book in some different ways. Um, all right, look at that, three o'clock on the dot. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, I know um, Colleen and Jackie had to head out already, but um, Carol and David, thanks for- oh, thanks Thank for you, this was really interesting. It yeah, was this, was, like, this was great. It was kind of reinvigorating um, to have this in the, you know, in such a busy day. So thank you, Chris, yeah. for doing this. Yeah, all right, well, thank you so much, guys. And, yeah, uh, thank you. and uh, David's, remember David's uh, workshop will be next week. I posted a link. Yep. Yeah, it's on the calendar. You can register. It's on the calendar, the Bristol yeah. calendar. So okay. you can register for it. I'll be sending the link out shortly before the event yeah. next week. So anyone's interested That's in that. Sounds that, interesting. That, you can continue to explore ideas of memory and stuff. Yeah. Sounds great. I definitely got to check that out. Okay, All take right. care. Take care. All right, see you later.